Okay, uh, so thank you very much for uh, the invitation and uh, uh, it's an honor to start the school. Uh, I actually thought it wasn't going to be my pleasure, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, let me know if you can't hear me very well or if I write too small on the blackboard or uh, anything like that. And please, uh, as Ellie said, uh, ask uh, any question during the during my talk. <coughs> uh, so what I will uh, talk about in my series of lectures is um, supersymmetric theories uh, on curved spaces. So let me start by giving some uh, introduction and motivation uh, to the topic. So this is a school about uh, localization. And um, as I'm sure you uh, know, uh, localization is a very powerful technique uh, by which uh, one can uh, compute exactly uh, many um, interesting observables in supersymmetric gauge theory, in supersymmetric theories. Uh, which are strongly coupled. And we, this technique allows us to get a non-perturbative determination of uh, certain observables. <coughs> so one thing which is uh, often uh, important when uh, uh, trying to localize a theory is uh, to uh, deform it from its uh, definition in flat space. So <coughs> So for instance, uh, one thing one can do is to uh, take some supersymmetric field theory uh, in flat space with some uh, degree of supersymmetry and then uh, place it on some uh, compact manifold preserving some supersymmetry. <coughs> um, so then uh, after this, it, there are like interesting observables can one can determine using uh, localization. So there is a very uh, long list of uh, examples about uh, this um, being put into practice. So I will not try to be exhaustive in my list, but I also only point uh, <coughs> to some uh, interesting, particularly interesting ones. Uh, so <coughs> well, I guess the first one that uh, we can start with is uh, just taking some supersymmetric field theory and putting it on like say, the four torus, if we are in, uh, in four dimensions. <coughs> and uh, then uh, we can uh, compute uh, the trace over uh, the Hilbert space uh, on T3 of minus 1 to the fermion number. <coughs> and that uh, is an index uh, which uh, was uh, uh, studied by Witten. So this is maybe like the simplest uh, example where you just uh, compactify the theory from flat space to live uh, on a torus. Uh, another example uh, also uh, due to Witten is that of considering some n equal to uh, theory in 4D uh, and then uh, topologically twisted uh, so that uh, it can live uh, on uh, uh, any uh, compact manifold of our choosing. <coughs> Another interesting deformation uh, that one can uh, study in the context uh, of uh, n equal to theories is the so-called omega background. And uh, this was uh, very successfully used uh, by Nekrasov to compute instanton partition functions. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> so these are somewhat uh, older uh, examples, but uh, then more recently uh, there has been like uh, a lot of uh, interesting developments uh, that make use of uh, uh, localization techniques in uh, supersymmetric field theory, and uh, they rely on placing uh, supersymmetric field theory, deforming supersymmetric field theory from flat space. So let me start with another famous example. So one can take an n equal to theory um, and place it on the fourth sphere. <coughs> so this was done by Peston. And then this allows to use uh, localization techniques to compute the partition function of the theory uh, or even the expectation value of certain supersymmetric Wilson loops uh, along the equator of the sphere. <coughs> and um, motivated by uh, these results, uh, there have been, uh, I mean, the people have looked at uh, uh, theories in higher and lower dimensions. So there has been a lot of work on n equal to theories in 3D uh, with a U1R symmetry. which can be placed uh, supersymmetrically uh, on the three sphere. So let me just remark about the previous example that uh, uh, you could say, okay, well, I already have a way to place an n equal to field theory on S4. I can just do the topological twist. So the theory of Peston is indeed different from the topologically twisted theory. Uh, in particular, uh, it uh, allows, so it has eight supercharges, which is much more than what you have in the topological twisted theory. Um, so similarly, one can uh, work in three dimensions with uh, uh, n equal two theories and uh, put them on the on the three sphere and again compute um, partition functions and other observables. So this was. Uh, initiated actually for n equal four theories by Kapustin, uh, Willett, and Yakov. And then there was uh, further work by uh, Amos, Omich, and Lee. And by Jeff Ferris. Uh, then, uh, in uh, uh, 2D, uh, a Francesco Benini, who is here, and uh, Cremonesi considered uh, n equal 2 comma 2 theories on the 2 sphere. So I suspect you will hear much more about this example in uh, Francesco's lectures. And uh, okay, so and also uh, people looked at uh, theories in uh, five dimensions. <laughs> yes. Then there is, as I said, I was not gonna. Uh, mine is not an exhaustive list. So if I miss one example that you worked on, like uh, you should not feel slighted. <laughs> um, okay, so then there are also examples in uh, in uh, five dimensions, uh, where like uh, starting with work of Shalen, Zabzin, and Q, and uh, Osumichi Song and Terashima, and also Jafferis and Pufu, people looked at uh, um, n equal one. Field theories in five dimension on the five sphere. <coughs> um, let me also mention another class of uh, geometries that, uh, so that it's not always a sphere. So one can 
take an n equal one uh, field theory in 4D uh, with a U1R symmetry. And uh, it can be placed preserving uh, all of the four supercharges on S3 times S1. And then one can define an index by taking the trace over the Hilbert space on S3 of minus 1 to the f times e to the minus beta h uh, plus decorations. And uh, this index can be computed exactly. So this was uh, uh, started by Romersberger. Uh, even if the supersymmetric field theory on S3 times S1 was actually written longer, much long before by uh, Diptimansen. <coughs> okay, so. So many of the geometries and theories that uh, I have uh, um, I've placed on the blackboard uh, actually allow for interesting deformations that preserve some amount of supersymmetry. So for instance, one can start squashing the spheres so that uh, they are no longer round. Um, and so let's put here. And the various observables that you can compute uh, can then depend on the deformations uh, that uh, you apply to the geometry uh, in different ways. Sometimes there are deformations that do not change supersymmetric observables, or it could be that you find a deformation that actually does change the value of uh, a supersymmetric observable. So then there is a question of understanding, uh, like why is that the case? and uh, what uh, geometrical information uh, do the supersymmetric observables that you can compute via localization or with some other technique actually depend on. <coughs> okay, so, so this was just a list that uh, is supposed to motivate like the following uh, three questions that uh, I will address uh, during my lectures. So the first, lecture, the first question, which I guess is quite natural, is like, uh, so given some, sup given some SUSY theory, uh, on which geometries um, can it be placed preserving some supersymmetry? So here I'm being uh, glib about what geometry means. Uh, so this uh, geometrical information can include like the metric or any other structure that we will find relevant. <coughs> so the second question that we would like to shed some uh, light on is uh, what is the structure that was of the resulting theory uh, and finally uh, as I was saying before um, we would like to understand uh, how supersymmetric observables depend on the geometry. So 
what, what do you mean by what is the structure, uh, more concretely? Well, for instance, you would like uh, to know, say, I take an anifold one field theorem for D, and I placed on some curved manifolds. So suppose this theory is a Lagrangian description, then what are the couplings that I have to write down on some specific manifold? That's one question that you might want to. <coughs> so yes, yeah, so these are pretty general. But uh, yeah. uh, any other question? Okay, so if there are uh, no other questions, I can uh, proceed. So let me think about what to do with the blackboard. Um, maybe I'll just erase this one. Okay, but I don't <laughs> think I need this one, so I'll just erase it and then I'll have more space later. So now, during uh, the first lecture, uh, I would actually like to introduce uh, a topic which is uh, perhaps not completely familiar to uh, many in the audience, uh, which is that of uh, supercurrents. So let me uh, motivate uh, a little why I want to talk uh, about this uh, to start. So let's consider some theory in flat space. Then you can imagine like deforming the metric to be slightly different than flat. So we can take some theory. Then take the metric of flat space and introduce some deformation. <coughs> so the way that uh, the theory reacts to such deformation is uh, via its energy momentum tensor. So the linearized metric deformation couples to the energy momentum tensor uh, of the theory. <coughs> now in a supersymmetric field theory, The energy momentum tensor uh, does, well, first of all, there is an energy momentum tensor, and it's part of a multiplet uh, with other currents and other operators. So it stands to reason that in studying uh, how to uh, place supersymmetric field theories in curved space, uh, we will need uh, to know what is the structure uh, of this multiplet. <coughs> so this multiplet is uh, called the supercurrent. So um, the references that you can look at uh, for this part of the talk. Uh, so there is a paper by um, Seiberg and Dumitrescu. Uh, that's 11.06. Zero, zero, three, one. Uh, and uh, also um, a paper by Komarut, Oski, and Seiberg. Um, which one is this? One, zero, zero, two, 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 eight. Mm. No. I messed it up. 
So no, it's correct. <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, this is by no way an exhaustive reference list, but uh, if you look at these two papers and at the list of references they're in, uh, I think you will be in a good, in a good shape. Okay. <coughs> so in particular, during uh, today's lecture, I will uh, talk about um, the uh, supercurrent uh, multiplets, uh, which are uh, appropriate for uh, n equal one uh, field theories in four dimensions. So at this point, um, I would like to make some comments about uh, notations. So I will follow uh, Wessenberger notations. Uh, so I hope you are familiar with that. But uh, if you're not, we can maybe discuss this during the exercise sessions. Or if you have a question about uh, some notational issue, you can ask me during the lecture, and there will be, and I'll try to answer. Um, directly. So, <coughs> so let me remind you about the SUSY algebra for these theories. So we have the anti-commutator between Q alpha and Q bar alpha dot. So that's even in terms of the four momentum. So actually, as you will see, we will modify this in a short while. <coughs> and then uh, two supercharges of the same chirality commute, anti-commute. <coughs> OK. So we would like to study uh, the uh, supermultiplet where the energy momentum tensor resides uh, for this uh, particular theories. Uh, and as we will see by uh, dimensional reduction, then one can get uh, also information about uh, other theories with four supercharges, namely uh, n equal to in three dimensions and n equal to comma two in two. Okay, so let's see. Maybe I can use this. Yeah, there is a stick uh, here. Oh, it's okay, but I think you might be. I mean, is there a problem because of the shade? Okay, <coughs> okay so what do we want uh, our uh, multiplet uh, to contain? So, well, as we said, we want uh, the multiplet to contain the energy momentum tensor. So I remind you that um, in a local uh, field theory, which is Poincaré invariant, uh, there exists. Uh, conserved real symmetric energy momentum tensor so it's important here that uh, the theory is Poincaré invariant so that like uh, you can show that uh, you can always improve the energy momentum tensor uh, to be symmetric. So <coughs> if you haven't seen this uh, already, I think one of the possible exercises for this afternoon will be to actually show that this is the case. OK, so <coughs> the four momentum P mu is, as usual, obtained by taking the integral over space of the mu 0 component 
of the energy momentum tensor. <coughs> now, the uh, energy momentum tensor, uh, the symmetric real energy momentum tensor, uh, is uh, not unique uh, because it can be changed by improvements. Um, so, in particular, we will focus uh, in these lectures on improvements of the following form. some scalar, let's call it small u. Okay, so this is not the most general improvement which uh, keeps the energy momentum tensor symmetric. Um, but uh, you can check that um, with this, what? No, I think I'm missing a piece. So with this definition, the uh, second piece that we added is uh, automatically conserved. And uh, also, if you try to compute the uh, momentum corresponding to the improved energy momentum tensor, you see that it won't change. So this improvement, trans improvement of the energy momentum tensor uh, does not spoil the conservation and does not change the corresponding charge. So this is one object uh, that uh, uh, our supercurrent has to contain. Then, because we are dealing with uh, supersymmetric field theories, uh, there will be supercharges, Q alpha and Q bar alpha dot. And uh, by applying Noether's procedure to the supersymmetry, you can find that uh, there are currents, conserved currents, which correspond to the supercharges. So in particular, we'll have conserve currents S mu, S alpha mu, and S bar alpha dot mu. Um, so they are conserved. Uh, and they uh, give, when integrated, they can give rise to the supercharges. So for instance, Q alpha, is the integral in d3x of s alpha 0. And the same is for q bar. Uh, again, the supercurrent is not unique, but uh, it can be changed uh, by improvements. And we will not write the most general improvement, but just the ones which will be relevant for later. So. I can take my supercurrent S alpha mu and shift it by a term of this form. And again, it's immediate to check that this piece is automatically conserved. Uh, <coughs> due to the anti-symmetry of sigma mu nu and uh, that it doesn't change the supercharge. And there is uh, an equivalent expression for S bar. Okay. So we certainly want these two objects uh, in our uh, supercurrent multiplet. <coughs> but uh, we also want uh, to impose other requirements. So another requirement that we want is that um, SS bar and T uh, are the uh, only uh, operators in the multiplet which have spin greater than one. So this is because we eventually want to couple this theory 
uh, to gravity and uh, in uh, supergravity in 4D we only have uh, degrees of freedom, the, the only degrees of freedom with spin greater than one are the ones correspond to the metric and the gravitino. And uh, the metric, as we know, uh, couples to the energy momentum tensor and the gravitino will couple to the supercurrent. Okay. <coughs> so that means that uh, if we want to embed uh, our um, supercurrent multiplet uh, in some superfield, then its highest spin component should reside in the theta theta bar component of the superfield. So we would imagine that uh, our superfield would be something, let's call it S mu, uh, it would be real, and its theta sigma nu theta bar component uh, will contain the um, energy momentum tensor. plus lower spin stuff. Sorry, why does it have to be in this component? What I'm saying is that if we want to take the embed our supercurrent in a superfield, then it's uh, the top spin, the, the operator with largest spin in the multiplet will reside in the theta theta bar component of the superfield. So that means that because we want to have some, the energy momentum tensor is the operator with larger spin, then it will have to reside in the theta, theta bar component of some superfield S mu. What type of constraint are we going to impose for S now? Well then we will see what the constraints are that, yeah. So that's the name of the game, is to find what constraints does this superfield satisfy. <coughs> okay. Um, so another requirement that uh, we will impose is that uh, the multiplet is indecomposable. Which means that we cannot separate it into two multiplets, two separate multiplets. Okay, so we want the minimal multiplet. So, not in distinct uh, this by the way does not mean that inside the multiplet uh, there aren't smaller submultiplets which are still multiplets under n equal one supersymmetry uh, however these submultiplets cannot be separated from the total multiplet um, without spoiling Susie Okay, <coughs> and finally, there is another very important uh, requirement: is that. Sorry, yes. Why is this important? Well, it's, it's just because we would like to have the minimal structure which contains the energy momentum tensor and other currents. <coughs> but is there an obstruction? Will you need it some in some way in the future, or you're just looking for the simplicity? Well, I mean. The point is that this will contain like the minimal structure which is indispensable. Uh, now when, for instance, you couple this uh, uh, theory to gravity, like the, uh, the supercurrent multiplet will tell you which supergravity to couple to. And it's true that you could imagine like uh, adding more fields to your supergravity and then maybe this will couple to a larger uh, supermultiplet. But somehow those fields can be separated. And the minimal part which contains the metric and the gravitino will be coupling to this, um, to this intercomposable multiplet. E so the, the other requirement that we want to have is that all operators in the multiplet are well defined so for instance uh, they have to be gauge invariant uh, if there is some gauge symmetry but we will see other examples of uh, constraints that 
follow from this requirement. Are there any other questions so far? So now um, we come to the point where like, uh, there is a very uh, long computation uh, to be done to understand uh, what is the, uh, well, either what are the constraints that need to be imposed on this S uh, such that uh, it contains these objects, uh, or uh, in component notations, uh, how do you construct uh, like the minimal amount of operators which will be closed under supersymmetry and have these properties. So this is a computation that I will not show, but I will tell you what the result is. Um, And to my defense, if you look at the references, they don't show the computation either. So, <laughs> okay. So we'll call this object the S multiplet. And uh, in the following, I will uh, show super field expressions, uh, but <coughs> always like uh, translate them in component notations for people who would are maybe less familiar with uh, uh, super field manipulations. <coughs> Yes. So just make sure. So you're saying S is, is the superfield that contains T mu nu and then all yes. the mm -hmm. mu, uh, So S is the multiplet which contains T mu nu oh, and uh, the, the, when you search it to that one particular theta term, it gives you T mu nu. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the lower, the, and then the other fields will be in the lower components. <coughs> okay. So unfortunately, I don't know if I can show this blackboard instead of. How do we do this? I can. No, this is the bad way to do it. <laughs> okay, let's. I don't know if you can see over there, but okay. <coughs> or maybe we can put this in top. Okay. All right, so, so let me tell you what are the components, uh, the operators that appear in this multiplet. So as we know, there is T mu nu, uh, which is uh, a conserved symmetric uh, tensor. So it has. Uh, 10 components because it's a symmetric tensor, but then it's conserved, so we have to subtract 4, so we are left with 6 degrees of freedom. Uh, then uh, it turns out that this multiplet contains uh, a, a two form, f mu nu, uh, which is closed. So this gives rise to another three degrees of freedom. Uh, then uh, it also contains, uh, so this as we know is real, this is also real. Now there is a complex one form.
which is also closed. So because this is complex, it has two degrees of freedom. Uh, then we have a real scalar, uh, we'll call it A, so that's one degree of freedom. Uh, so let's uh, count, uh, missing something, yes. So then there is a current which is not generically conserved. call it jmu and that's four degrees of freedom so if we sum this we get six plus four ten plus four plus two sixteen bosonic degrees of freedom and then we have uh, fermions so there is the supercurrent s mu alpha and s bar mu alpha dot uh, so these are conserved so instead of having 8 degrees of freedom each uh, they have 8 minus 2 so it's 6 plus 6 and then in the multiplet uh, there are also spin a half fermions psi alpha and psi bar alpha dot <coughs> so that gives 2 and 2 So again, the sum is 16. So we have a multiplet which contains 16 bosonic degrees of freedom and 16 fermionic uh, degrees of freedom. So excuse me, uh, what do you mean by this complex one form has two degrees of freedom? Yeah. Well, OK, so let's forget about the fact that instead of taking this to be closed, let's take it to be exact. Then it will correspond to a complex scalar. Or you can just count constraints, right? You have uh, four components minus, minus three constraints, but it's complex. Does that answer the question? I didn't understand what, what you mean by this. Complex means it, it is always decomposed into. So there is a real part and the imaginary part. Yes. OK, the real part is a one form, so it has four components. Yes. And there are three constraints, okay. so one. And then times two, because there is also the imaginary part. <coughs> okay, so okay, so these are the components which uh, are contained into these uh, multiplets. Now I can also give the superfield expression, so which shows which constraint it has to satisfy. So d alpha s alpha alpha dot equals chi alpha plus y alpha and d bar alpha dot chi alpha is equal to zero d alpha chi alpha to d bar alpha dot chi bar alpha dot and finally d alpha y beta plus <coughs> d beta y alpha is equal to zero with d bar square y alpha is equal to zero. <coughs> uh, sometimes in the literature you find this uh, last field y alpha replaced by d alpha of a chiral field. However, it's not always the case that uh, this uh, chiral field X is well defined. So one has to be careful. Uh, so this is the most, uh, the most general one. And uh, you 
can find component expression for the superfields in the papers that uh, I cited. I'm not going to write it down because it's going to take completely because it's going to take a long time, but I just give a flavor for it. So this superfield as mu is going to start with this non-conserved current j mu. And then in the theta component, you will find the supercurrent plus derivative of psi, which I'm not, sorry, plus psi, which I'm not going to uh, put. Um, then there is also a theta bar component which contains s bar plus other stuff. Um, and then the theta square component contains this uh, complex one form. And then finally, uh, as advertised, and well, it's going to be here, the theta, theta bar component contains the energy momentum tensor, but uh, it also contains this scalar field A and uh, something which is proportional to this two form, close to form F nu nu. And finally, a derivative of the current. Okay, and uh, in the papers you can also find expression for chi alpha and y. Uh, but I'm not going to spend time uh, writing those down. So just to make sure, so the statement is that if you enforce the, the conditions you had yeah. before, then that fixes the S-mark by yes. being equal to this one? Yeah, so if it isn't decomposable, it only has uh, operators with up to spin 2. Uh, it contains a symmetric energy momentum tensor and the supercurrent. And what do dots stand for here? Here? So that's because I'm lazy. But uh, OK, I could have not been lazy. But uh, so for instance, here you have uh, minus i over square root of 2 sigma mu of psi and uh, some similar term over there. But they are uniquely fixed. Yes, the all, all of it is, uh, is, fixed, uh, is fixed uniquely. <coughs> so for exercise, I mean, if you really want, you could take this uh, and show that, uh, so you can write down the most general real superfield uh, S mu. It will contain a lot of terms. And then you can impose these constraints, and you will find out the you will find out that uh, these constraints impose that uh, T mu is conserved, that uh, S mu and S bar mu are conserved, uh, and uh, this F has to be closed, uh, and this uh, Y and Y bar have to be closed as well. Just a quick question, what would be the start of the argument in the other way? So how would you, um, I mean, I, I believe you, but I don't really see how do we really start arguing from essentially the requirements you made to this set of equations? Well, basically, you have to use the supersymmetry algebra. So, um, OK, one, one way you can do it is by using superfields. I mean, you start with the most uh, general uh, real superfield. And then you want to find constraints which impose the fact that T mu is conserved, for instance. So that's one way. The other way is that you start with T mu and with S, and then you use the supersymmetry algebra. So this, this you will see in a, in, a, in a second. Maybe it will be more, more apparent. Um, OK. So, uh, so before I get to uh, the improvements, let me um, I have another question So you are expressing S mu and there is S mu in the expression. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. This is, uh, this is bad. So this is the superfield. Uh, let's uh, call it uh, S with a squiggle in it. And uh, this is the supercurrent. So 
this is actually spinor indices contracted with theta. Right. Okay. So that's, that adds in the expression is the S. Uh, this is the supercurrent. This is just the super multiplet. <coughs> yeah, sorry for the. Mm. Any other question? Yes. Uh, this structure of the supercurrent, can you understand from higher dimension? By, uh, I am not sure because this is n equal one. Uh, so I'm sure, for instance, if you were considering n equal two in 4D, you could presumably understand it from n equal one in 5D, and uh, and so on. Uh, okay. So good. So now as a I argue that this multiplet contains all these various operators. Um, and in particular, like you could, uh, you could like uh, ask yourself, like, can I see these uh, operators in the in the supersymmetry algebra? <coughs> so, and the answer is yes, but uh, uh, it requires to um, it requires to like extend a little bit what uh, we usually uh, write for the for the SUSY algebra. So let me maybe write here. Mm. Can everybody see if I write here? OK. <coughs> so one thing one can do is by using the superfield expression or the supersymmetry transformation rules, like we can build out what uh, the anti-commutator between a supercharge and, say, the supercurrent is. So if I were to integrate the left-hand side of this expression with respect to D3x, I will get the anticommutator between q bar and q. So if I use the superfield, what I guess is that uh, this is q sigma nu alpha alpha dot. Then there is a piece that you imagine has to be there. Right? Because when I integrate over D3x, I want to recover the four momentum on the right-hand side of the superalgebra. But you also get another piece that is called C mu nu, where C mu nu is not symmetric, it's anti-symmetric. And also, there can be Schwinger terms. The Schwinger terms as well are completely fixed by the um, by the superfield. Maybe can you say one more word? What, is, uh, what are the Schwinger terms? Well, we can even write them down. Uh, well, first I want to say uh, one more word about this, and then we can go on to the one more word about the Schwinger terms. So, C mu nu, you don't see C mu nu in this list. So what is it? OK, C mu nu is actually built out of this f. This is a bad place to be. OK. So C mu nu is written in this way in terms of f. And from this definition and the fact that f is closed, uh, you recover immediately that uh, C mu nu is conserved. So C mu nu is a conserved current, which, uh, has, uh, which is antisymmetric in the two indices. So it's a string current. So in particular, if I were to integrate with respect to uh, d3x <coughs> the zero component of s0, of s mu, I will get from this that q bar alpha dot with q alpha is equal to q sigma nu alpha alpha dot p nu plus 
z nu, where p nu is as defined over there, and uh, z mu is uh, similarly defined as uh, the integral in d3x of c mu 0. Can you repeat the argument to include the senior new in, in the algebra? So no, the way you do it is by just uh, so it's q bar acting on s mu alpha. So you can take your superfield, and then you know how the supercharge acts on the superfield. You can compute your derivatives, and that's what you get on the other side. Um, vice versa, the other way to find this multiplet would be to start from q bar with s is equal to 2 sigma t, and then uh, say, OK, so then if I vary s, I should get something proportional to t. So that tells you like what the relation between s and t is, and so on and so forth. Try to build it component by component, which is, however, somewhat harder. Working in superfields is easier. So, uh, is this the string current related to this uh, equation, it's a self-dual equation or something like that? Yes, so this, uh, this string current that appears here in terms of component of the S-multiplet is related to F. So there is a... So is it the self-dual part? Or? No, it's just the dual of F. And because F is closed, then it's automatically conserved. Um, OK, so like the, the reason why you don't usually see the supersymmetry algebra written in this way is that this uh, string charge uh, coming from the string current uh, is actually infinite for any uh, string object which would carry it. Like it's an infinitely long string, it will have an infinite, infinite charge. <coughs> uh, so in the same way as for the as for the uh, Qs, we can also do the, um, repeat this for <coughs> the other commutation relations, which are Q alpha with S mu uh, beta. So what do we find here? Well, uh, so with the correct normalizations, so we get sigma alpha beta nu rho times c mu nu rho. And uh, what is c mu nu rho? That, OK, so c mu nu rho is antisymmetric, and uh, it is equal, um, well, it's proportional to epsilon mu nu rho lambda y bar lambda. So again, because this y is closed, then it's automatically conserved. And uh, it corresponds to a domain wall current. Again, for any domain wall you can find in an n equal one uh, field theory, uh, this uh, would be infinite. Uh, so the, the, the corresponding charge will be in infinite. So we can write here what the commutator between q alpha and q beta is. It's going to be sigma mu nu alpha beta times z mu nu, where again, z mu nu is defined as the integral in d3x of c mu nu <coughs> 0. Sorry, is it a general statement that uh, antisymmet conserved antisymmetric tensors correspond to higher like, string currents of the main wave currents? Yeah, I mean, those are uh, objects that like, uh, would are like naturally carried by extended uh, extended object. Then in, in any theory under consideration, you can actually check if there are uh, extended objects that do carry uh, this uh, 
this um, this charge. So actually, we will see examples uh, if I get to it. <laughs> like from the uh, supercurrent on the C to C to bar line, we also have A field and the J field. Yeah, right. right. Those don't appear in the algebra. So you can see, for instance, that uh, this current J mu would not appear in this uh, in this commutator because, but well, it's not even conserved. So there is no corresponding charge. Okay, which but. Besides, I'm only, I'm only considering these anti-commutators. If you consider anti-commutators with other components, then you might find these other <coughs> operators. Here I'm just looking at the commutator, the anti-commutators which result in the SUSY algebra. But, I mean, you could consider others. Like, for instance, you could consider the commutator between J mu and Q, or, yeah, and that uh, will be the proportional to S and so on. Does the, the distribution also have some like Schumann terms? Uh, no, this one actually does not. Uh, so, uh, right, and now I remember that they should comment on the Schinger terms. So the Schinger terms are terms which do not contribute to the charge, at least under the assumption that things behave nicely enough uh, at infinity. And in this particular case, they are determined by the structure of the s multiplet. So for instance, those Schringer terms over there will be uh, equal to sigma nu alpha alpha dot, which multiplies So you can convince yourself that uh, indeed um, this give like total derivatives that do not contribute to the supercharge. So what is domain one here? Uh, so uh, it depends on, so given some theory, you can check if it has or not domain walls which carry this charge. So for instance, if you consider some Vesumino model with some cubic superpotential, like uh, it might have two supersymmetric vacua, and then there could be a BPS domain wall interpolating between the two. And then, yeah, what is here? I mean, what, what is the dominant here? I mean, so why you write those? It's mean, so why why sitting so here? Well, I'm saying this comes from the so from taking the anti-commutators of QVTS, you discover this current, and then you interpret it as some conserve current which uh, when integrated would give some charge which would be carried by some extended object. So this is the BPS charge you're saying? It would be? Well, the, the, the object can or cannot be BPS, but I if it saturates some bound, then it could be BPS, yes. Okay. Um, now I have to decide what to erase. So, so, sorry. so you said usually the string charge and the domain wall charge are infinite. Yes. And, and that's because of the, uh, the infinite volume. Yeah, the infinite volume of the so string. Compactify yeah, yeah, if you were to compactify, but right. Uh, th then, then it would be different. <coughs> uh, okay, so... I'm running late, but that's fine, I guess. So any other question on this uh, on this so far? Okay, so if there are no other questions, let me proceed with uh, uh, talking about the possible improvements to this uh, supercurrent multiplet. So as we saw before, the various components that enter into this, uh, into this multiplets can be improved. For instance, the energy momentum tensor can be improved, the supercurrent might be improved. So there is a way to encode all these improvements in, like a, in a supersymmetric fashion. So I guess I'm gonna erase this top one.
そうそう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、Uh, can be encoded inside、uh, a real superfield U. So, as it's familiar from people who have looked at Wessenbagger, this has some component expansion like so. Etc. Etc. <coughs> And then, in terms of the superfield, the improvement of the supercurrent works in the following way. So S changes this way, and chi alpha goes into chi alpha plus. As follows. Okay, so actually, this u、uh, need not be well defined. It can be changed by a constant, and nothing will be,、uh, and nothing will be amiss because the various improvements will not change if you shift u by a constant. So u is it's well defined up to a constant. Okay, so this looks a little bit esoteric, but we can check what、uh, these improvements are、uh, on the various components. So, well, there is a reason why I used little u over there. So, the improvement of the energy momentum tensor is just the same as I wrote there, but、uh, with u being the bottom component of、uh, the superfield. And、uh, that's also the reason why I've chosen this funny factor of two in that expression because the eta over there is the same eta which appears in the superfield U. <coughs> okay? So that tells us what are the improvements for the supercurrent and the energy momentum tensor, but、uh, there are also improvements for, the,、uh, for other operators which,、um, which enter into the supermultiplet. And、uh, in particular,、uh, the improvement for the two form F mu nu、uh, is as follows. F mu nu goes into F mu nu minus、uh, an exact two form, which, as you would imagine, is related to this V. Uh, and the one complex one form y mu、uh, gets shifted by an exact one form, which is related to the Derivative of n. Sorry, could you motivate a little bit why you need this improvement? Okay, so yes, we will we'll get exactly there. But uh, uh, the idea, I can tell you what the idea is、uh, in a second. So basically, we said that uh, this uh, multiplet uh, is indecomposable. Okay, so this is true、uh, <coughs> as long as there are no further, um, no further um, constraints that are correct. But you can see that if, for instance, this two form,、uh, instead of being、uh, closed, is exact, then by doing this improvement, I could set it to zero. Okay? So that means that、uh, there are cases in which I can expect to be able to shorten the multiplet even more than it is already short, but this requires extra constraints to be put in. So we'll understand what these、uh, extra requirements are and what are the different structures that emerge. But so if you look at these expressions, and、uh, very easily you see that 
Uh, if it were true that uh, there exists a well-defined u such that chi alpha is equal to minus 3 half d bar d alpha u, then I can set all chi alpha to zero. And uh, on the other hand, if there is a well-defined u such that uh, y alpha is minus a half d alpha d bar alpha u, then I can set y alpha to zero. <coughs> so this is in superfield language. So this will correspond to two different shortenings that the multiplets can undergo. Okay. Are <coughs> uh, there other questions? Okay, so given like the fact that there has been a lot of quite formal stuff going on, it's a good idea to give an example. Uh, so the example I will consider is that of Vesumino models. Okay, so Vesumino models are uh, depend on two datas. One is a Keller potential, which depends on the chiral field and anti-chiral fields in your theory. Now, the Keller potential in a Vesumino model need not be well defined. Uh, indeed, the theory only depends on the Keller metric. So that means that I can uh, shift the Keller potential by Keller transformations. So K can be shifted by um, an holomorphic function of the chiral field plus an anti-holomorphic function of the anti-chiral fields. And indeed, this does not change uh, the Keller metric, which is given by taking the derivative of the Keller potentials. And because there is an holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic derivative, this shift does not change the Keller metric. Uh, the other piece of data that you need to define your Vesumino model is a superpotential, which is an holomorphic function of the chiral fields phi i. Uh, and again, uh, the superpotential need not be well defined. Uh, indeed, you can always shift it by a constant and nothing changes because the theory only depends on derivatives of the superpotentials. What do you mean by not well defined in these cases? Well, for instance, you could have a, a chiral field which uh, is... Um, so let, let's consider a chiral... F a, a theory which, is, uh, which has a canonical Keller potential and uh, there is one chiral field phi uh, which is identified with radius 1. So phi is the same as phi plus 1. It's modulo 1, you were saying. Yeah, so phi, the, this chiral field is identified with phi plus 1. Okay, so then I can consider a theory which has superpotential equal to phi. Okay, and uh, well, this theory will be supersymmetric even if the superpotential is not well defined because like it changes by a constant as I go around phi. Well, it's, it's defined on the circle then, maybe, because it's shifted by one, and if you just should wait. Yeah, phi lives on the circle, but w is phi. So, so phi, <laughs> w is not well defined on the circle. Okay. It's more of a, a cylinder because phi is complex, but yeah, for instance, that's... So, the, again, when you write the Lagrangian of a Zumino model, you only have derivatives of superpotential, so a shift by a constant is not, uh, is not problematic. Okay. <coughs> so then, we can write down what the various operators in the supersymmetry multiplet, uh, in the supercurrent multiplet, are. So we can start it, so can just write the entire multiplet. So S alpha alpha dot is Q times the Keller metric So there are very explicit expression for all these objects. And uh, to your heart content, you can check that uh, they do satisfy the definition 
over there. So that's d bar square d alpha k. And y alpha is 4 times d alpha of w. So one thing that you can notice is that they are all well defined uh, when uh, k uh, undergoes a Keller transformation, or w undergoes shift by a constant. OK, so you probably all know what the expression for the energy momentum tensor and the supercurrent is for these models. But uh, uh, it would be interesting to check what these other operators in the um, supercurrent multiplets actually look like. So for instance, the two form f mu nu um, is given by the following expression. So it's i times g i j bar <coughs> times d mu phi i d mu phi bar j bar. Okay. So if you stare at this, uh, you recognize that this is nothing else but the pullback of uh, the Keller form. Uh, so if you consider the Keller form corresponding to the Keller metric K, that's I G I J bar D phi I wedge D phi bar J bar. Okay, so this is on target space, then you can pull back, pull it back to um, to space time, and what you get it is, uh, is this F menu. <coughs> OK, so this is already is enough uh, for us to make some interesting comments, uh, because it's well known that, uh, at least locally, the Keller form uh, can be written as uh, d of something. Where this uh, a is given by scalar connection is given by this. So now you can check that uh, this connection A is not well defined under Keller transformations. So it does shift. So in particular, uh, that means that uh, this uh, f mu nu, uh, whenever the so whenever the um, this uh, connection is not well defined, uh, will be closed but not exact. Okay. So when does this happen? So for instance, whenever the target space of your uh, Bessemer model is compact then the Keller form uh, cannot be exact because some power of it is going to give the volume form. Uh, and then, in those cases, the uh, f mu nu, which, as we saw, is related to the string current, uh, will not be exact, but it will just be closed. <coughs> so a, a simple example of this occurrence is the CP1 model, where you take uh, the Keller potential to be f squared times the log of 1 plus phi phi bar. So you have a single chiral field with uh, this Keller potential. Um, then the target space is CP1, uh, which is compact, uh, and the Keller uh, and, the uh, and the Keller metric is just uh, the Fubini study metric. So this model will have an f mu which is uh, closed but not exact. And then uh, it means that there is no improvement transformation which, we can be which can be used to set this f to 0. 
because f, the improvement transformation, can only shift away the exact part of f, but not, uh, cannot shift away f if it's closed, but not exact. <coughs> so the other object of interest is this uh, one form y mu, uh, which is very easy. It's just uh, di of the superpotential times d mu of i i. So again, you could, you could say this is just the derivative of the superpotential. Uh, but uh, that's, so that's fine. But uh, the superpotential itself is not well defined because it can shift by a constant. So in particular, if we consider the case I was, this model I was talking about before, where we have a scalar field with shifts by a constant, is identified with itself plus a constant, uh, then y mu will be a closed one form, but it's not going to be exact because the object that it will be the differential of is not well defined. It's the superpotential. And the superpotential is defined, is shifts by a constant. No, the, 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 the superpotential is shifted by constant. It's, uh, the derivative is well defined because. Uh, yeah, yeah. The y mu is well defined. So it's the superpot it's, but, but it's not exact. Yeah, it's not exact, but derivative is not exact. Yeah, it's closed, but not, yeah, that's, uh, th that's the point. <coughs> so in particular, that means that in this particular model, we will not be able to use these improvements uh, to shift away y mu, because the only way to do it would be to use uh, n proportional to the superpotential, but th that is not a well-defined operator. OK. Um, so I have nine minutes, correct? So let's see what... Uh, okay, so I will talk about the two special cases and then I will leave the, re <coughs> the rest for the next lecture. Um, so unfortunately I'm going a little bit slower than expected. Um, Sorry, I have a question yeah. before you continue in this time to ask. I'm confused how, uh, so you, you've labeled all of these uh, fields in the end of form one, but I'm confused what, so energy momentum tensor is, to, is clear. So how do you get that mu nu and how do you get this one mu and, I mean, or this non conserved current? They have to be there in order for the multiple to be consistent with the super, super with the supersymmetry algebra. Right, but is there some definition of it? I, somebody give me a theor theory, yes. and is there a prescription how I get each of these? So team you know there is, right? We know how to do that, but the, the supercurrent as well. The supercurrent is And well. then the others you get by doing Suzy transformations. Mm -hmm. So they are all related to each other by, by supersymmetry. Okay, I see. Uh, well, if you add an expression for the lowest component, then it would be pretty easy to find all the other ones by just varying that. And, but is there a physical inter interpretation of them? I mean, for, for the... Yes, the there is. Uh, w well, I've given two interpretations here. Those are the domain wall current and the string current. Uh, but uh, in a second, you can see that there, would, there, are, there are also nice interpretations for other objects. <coughs> uh, OK, uh, other questions? Okay, if not, um, let's see what I can erase. Um, probably I will erase this one. So now we look at special cases where the um, S multiplet can be made shorter by using improvements. OK, so there are two main special cases. So I don't know if I'll be able to talk about both of them, but let's start with the first one. So the first one uh, happens uh, whenever there is a well-defined u such that you can shift away chi alpha. So if this operator chi alpha can be written as a d bar square of d alpha u, mm. 
minus 3 halves. Then by using this improvement transformation, I can decouple chi alpha, or I, I can set chi alpha to 0. OK. <coughs> yes? Raise up the blackboard a little bit. This one? Yeah. OK. It's better? Maybe even that. OK, then we can set chi alpha to be equal to 0. <coughs> So I'll, I'll tell you what this implies uh, for, the various, uh, for the various components. Um, so it implies, so it implies that f mu nu is equal to 0. So this form is actually equal to 0. So that means that before doing the improvement, it had to be exact so that I can shift it away using v. OK, so this requires f mu nu before the improvement to be exact. And then uh, the other thing that implies that this scalar field A is equal or proportional to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And uh, in the similar way, this uh, fermion psi uh, is proportional to the contraction of sigma mu with s bar. So uh, when f mu is exact, it is tautology to say f mu mu is equal to zero. No, 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 no. I'm saying if you start with an f mu mu which is exact, then you can use the improvement. To make it zero. Even if it's exact, means, uh, it's the definition, the, the definition of the curvature tensor. If you get it's exact, then it's, it should be zero. So it no. doesn't come from supersymmetry. <laughs> I'm not saying that this comes from supersymmetry. I'm saying if you have an f mu which is exact, then it's d of a one form. So then you can improve it away. I'm not saying this is. Uh, okay, so. So, OK, so what does this mean? So this means that in uh, any such theory where the, uh, where the S multiplet can be improved in this way, uh, such theory cannot uh, have uh, the string charge because the string charge is related to S. So in particular, in this theory, there will not be uh, BPS strings. Uh, so this multiplet, which one obtains by, uh, by setting chi alpha to zero uh, as a name, it is called the ferrara zumino supermultiplet. And uh, we can count the number of degrees of freedom in the ferrara zumino supermultiplet. Well, it's 16 plus 16, but then we take away the three degrees of freedom in f mu nu and one degree of freedom in a. Uh, so that means that we are left with 12, and we are also left with 12 degrees of freedom for the fermions because the psi's are related to the s's. So this is 12 plus 12 degrees of freedom. Twelve bosonic and twelve fermionic. So that's the first uh, special case. Uh, the second special case is maybe more interesting. Um, but I don't know if I really have time for it. Five, Five minutes. Okay, oh. then, 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 then I have time. Um, so the the other special case. Let me just erase the name here. Uh, so let let me say some other comments. So from from this, it's clear, for instance, that uh, if you are if you have a with the Zumino model where the target space is compact, then the Keller form cannot be exact. Therefore, this model cannot have an FC multiplet. OK, so that's already a statement that we can make. Um, and there will be other examples of models which do not uh, allow an FC multiplet. So the other case is, uh, let's suppose that Y alpha can be written as minus a half of d alpha d bar squared of u for a well-defined u. 
then we can improve y mu, so yeah, then we can improve y alpha to zero. Okay. <coughs> so what does this mean on the component is actually quite interesting. So it sets the scalar a to zero, the one form y mu can be set to zero. Again, this is using this improvement. So that means that the one form has to be exact and not just closed in order for this to be done. The fermion psi alpha is also set to zero. And uh, there is a further constraint that needs to be satisfied, which is uh, quite interesting. And that's the fact that the non-conserved current J mu is actually conserved. OK? <clears throat> so now, what is this current? So it's a U1 current, which is conserved and appears in the supersymmetry algebra. It's a conserved R current. So what this means is that uh, if I have a model which has a conserved R current, then actually I can revert this logic and I can start from the conserved R current, put it at the bottom of the multiplet, and then re obtain all the rest of the multiplet by just acting with supersymmetry on the conserved R current. So any model which has a conserved R current allows for this particular kind of super multiplet. In particular, you can see that this model here with the scalar field which uh, shifts by a constant uh, does not uh, allow an R current. If there were an R symmetry, the superpotential would have to have R charge 2 in some units, which means that phi would have R charge 2. But because phi is identified with itself plus 1, it is only consistent with having R charge 0. So then that means that uh, this model cannot have an R current, and therefore it cannot have this multiplet, which is called the R multiplet. OK, I will uh, say more things about FC multiplet and R multiplet uh, in the next lecture. It seems to me usually the, in the n plus <coughs> series, R current always suffers from anomaly, right? So no, there are cases where it doesn't. But uh, for example, if you have an anomalous R current. If you have an anomalous R current, then the theory does not have an R multiplet. So for instance, if you take pure superior mills, that uh, is an anomalous R current, therefore it has no R multiplet. It turns out it has an FZ multiplet. And indeed, there are domain walls, but no supersymmetric strings. Which we do 